at the start, I would like to introduce our, our guest speaker, so uh, Dr. Julian Steer. So it is a great ple uh, pleasure we have you to give us a, a, a talk. So Julia, uh, Dr. Julian Steer is originally from the camps industry, uh, where he held roles in the new product development, scale up, and the full scale manufacturing of photo imaginable polymers for circuit board coatings. And Julia is now based in the School of Engineering uh, at the Cardiff University, where Julia give, uh, gives some dynamics and uh, carry out research on the themes of energy, waste, and the environment. Uh, in the last uh, 10 years, Dr. Julia Steer have, has worked closely with the steel industry, uh, carry out research on a range uh, of topics, including hydrometallurgic and uh, pyrometallurgic recovery of metals from uh, process dust, uh, alternative and novel both process modifications to increase the recovery of iron in dust and the micro analysis of particulates and the optimization and the selection of codes for blast furnace uh, code injection and build out and uh, catalyst mechanisms to utilize industrial carbon dioxide production. Uh, Dr. Julia uh, Steer is currently carrying out a project funded by the Sustain uh, Network, collaborating with Tata Steel, N and P Recycling, and Swansea University. Uh, investigating the incorporation of paper and the plastics uh, as alternative reductants for the blast furnace process to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from our making. Uh, personally, I have known uh, Julian for a number of years, and uh, I'd like to thank Julian to, uh, in the past, uh, support our PhD students to use uh, his uh, outstanding equipment. And uh, now, Julia, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, One, thank you very yeah. much, Zushu. Yeah. Thank you. And first of all, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak today. Um, it's a great chance for me, actually, to scrutinize uh, CO2 emissions from the steel making industry. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about more specifically, the iron making process, because that's been a big part of my most recent research. So as Zushu said, uh, I'm currently funded by the Sustain Network, and I'm sure uh, maybe all of you are aware of um, the Sustain Network, the Strategic University Steel Technology and Innovation Network, and looking at alternative reductants in the blast furnace with a view to reducing the CO2 emissions associated with the process. But firstly, before I start on the, the presentation proper, I think what's very clear is that this is an exciting time for the industry. Uh, it feels like there's a, a growing momentum to reduce greenhouse gases, um, both with government policy, targets, media coverage, public opinion, but also, very importantly, there's a lot of industrial activity now, and there's a growing amount of industrial activity and quite diverse activity. And that's what I'm going to try and cover for you today. Um, and so, hopefully, this will be of relevance to, to, to all of you. Right, so, firstly, what's the situation? And we can't obviously talk about iron production unless we talk about steel production. Um, and world steel production has been increasing substantially over the, the last 20 years. So um, we've seen massive increases in world steel production, driven mainly in Southeast Asia, driven mainly by China, who have predominantly adopted the blast furnace, basic oxygen furnace, um, route to making to making steel. Um, in the in the UK, the UK steel requirement is somewhere in the region of 20 million tons. So that works out per capita of about 300 kilograms per person. And what's quite striking is that the UK buys uh, buys a lot of that imports a lot of that that requirement in. Although we produce 
um, a total of around 7.3 million tonnes. About 5.6 million tonnes of that is from the blast furnace and the remaining uh, 1.7 million tonnes is from the electric arc furnace. Now on the right hand side I've put a, a figure that just just to kind of recap really, I know many of you will be aware of the different routes for, for making iron and steel. Um, we've got a couple of blast furnaces in the UK at Tata and British Steel. Uh, so on the left hand side, you've got the blast furnace, which takes uh, materials that require some pre-processing, so turning coal into coke, uh, and then using that fine, fine ore uh, to produce a, a, synth, a, a synth product. Um, those raw materials then go into the iron making process and then that goes into a basic oxygen furnace. On the right hand side we've got then the, the, the other end of the spectrum which would be the recycled steel going into the electric arc furnace and then in between we've got other technologies which although are um, currently uh, well developed um, they're not always well used then. So we've got direct reduced iron, we've got uh, shaft furnaces, rotary kiln furnaces, fluidized bed, we've got a range of different other um, production routes in between that blast furnace and the, the electric arc furnace. So what about worldwide production? Well, I guess what I want to emphasize in this slide is that First of all, global crude steel production in 2019 was 1.8 billion tonnes. It's a massive amount of um, production there. And it's, it's, it's dominated by two technologies, really, the blast furnace and the electric arc furnace. The blast furnace itself takes up the majority, about 70% of global steel production is from the blast furnace. And that represents primary production, you know, about 90% of the primary production. And so what we're referring to there is production from mined iron or iron oxide, or a variety of different iron oxides then. Then the electric arc furnace uh, and the blast furnace combined account for 95% of all of the steel production. So it's, it's dominated by these two real technologies, even though we've got these we've got other options open to us. And I think at this point, it's worth emphasizing that it looks looks like this situation is, is set for a, a big change now, because um, when we're considering CO2, reducing CO2 emissions, uh, we're starting to look at some of these other technologies and combinations of those technologies. So where are we with the current situation with regard to CO2 emissions. So on the top left hand side, I've got a table there from the um, International Energy Agency Iron and Steel Technology Roadmap. They produced a roadmap at the end of last year, actually. That kind of emphasizes where we're at really on terms of the specific intensity of CO2 per ton of hot metal. And uh, there's some variation in the amount of CO2 that's produced per tonne, as you'd imagine, there's a variety of different scales of and efficiencies of plant around the world. Uh, but basically what we're emphasizing that is that the blast furnace has a higher specific intensity. So we're around a, a couple of tons of CO2 per tonne of, of hot metal. Then the directly reduced uh, iron, which might go into an electric arc furnace then is, is is, is less and then the, the lowest of the current technologies which are, are, are adopted is the scrap based electric arc furnace. So it's quite a considerable difference there at 0.3 tonnes CO2 per tonne of, of hot metal out of that furnace. And in terms of global um, greenhouse gas emissions, you know, iron and steel is a big part of you know, 2.6 gigatons of CO2 emissions per year. So it produces a, a, a lot of emissions. Um, and as a percent, it's usually represented as a percentage of the the energy uh, the energy sector of greenhouse gas emissions and where it's 7.2 percent of uh, of those overall energy emissions. And then 
uh, a lower percentage as a as a percentage of the the total greenhouse gas emissions, which are 49 around the 49 gigatons of CO2 equivalents uh, per year. So it's a big producer. It's the number one in the heavy industries, and this is all set against this background of um, global demand for steel increasing by more than a third uh, up until uh, 2050. And it's another thing that's worth emphasizing as well is that a lot of the um, growth in steel production in Southeast Asia is relatively young growth as well. So um, a lot of the production capacity um, is still quite young. So I think uh, we've got a figure there of around 13 years of age on average that's accounting for ref recent refurbishments. So it's going to be quite a challenge to uh, to, to move away from that, that current blast furnace in, in those regions then. So in terms of the energy, primary ore based production um, is, is around 15 gigajoules per, per tonne. So it's far and away uh, it represents far and away the the most energy intensive of the of the processes. The scrap based route is is down at two gig, gigajoules per ten, so significantly better, significantly lower energy requirement there. And then I've just put a figure of um, just to to put some perspective on that. Um, per ten, bread takes around six gigajoules per per ten. Of course, that's quite a highly processed material. Um, when it comes to energy, it's number two uh, among the heavy industries. And over the, since 1960s up until the 1990s, there was a real quite a rapid decrease in the energy consumption per ton of, of crude steel production. But that rapid, uh, the, the rate of that um, reduction now has, has slowed. It's not stagnated, but it's it slowed. And you can see a lot of that energy as sort of um, associated with steel production is from from coal, is coal derived energy. So my talk is going to be split mainly into two parts. I'm going to look at the current blast furnace situation and opportunities there are to reduce emissions. And I'm going to reflect on some of my own work and, and some of the work that's been supported by Sustain. And then I'm going to look at the future direction of iron making and steel making. So we put some context in it and look at you know, what other countries and what other um, suppliers and producers are, are looking at. So just going through the technology routes quickly again. We've got this blast furnace and of course this energy, high energy requirement and the CO2 emissions is a carbon based uh, thermochemical process. And it requires processing these raw materials quite significant before we charge them to the furnace, even even before we start to use them. And of course, that results in these this uh, this energy intensity. Then we have smelting reduction. Now that hasn't got the pre-processing of, of producing coke and producing uh, agglomerated fines in the form of sinter. Um, and that, that also produces, like the blast furnace, also produces a liquid hot metal product, which tends to go into a basic oxygen furnace, tends to. Then we have the, the direct reduction, which uses iron ore directly um, with gases. Uh, they could be uh, syn gases uh, or hydrogen, possibly, um, or coke oven gas, um, depending on, and they were very well established um technologies uh that are that are in place in the industry for producing directly reduced sponge iron so in the solid form it's a lower temperature that's why the energy emissions associated with it are lower it's a lower temperature and it tends to be used to improve the quality uh of the final product from the electric arc furnace and then uh, as we described previously we've got scrap derived um, steel production from the electric arc furnace. And we'll cover um, some of these in a little bit more detail later. So right, in terms of the blast furnace, blast furnace iron making, in terms of the energy balance, you know, it's a very 
energy intensive process. It's if ever you get the chance to see a, a blast furnace up the uh, up in person, I really recommend it. You know, these these reactors, these thermochemical reactors, are some of the most grand pieces of in engineering that you could ever imagine. They're massive. These are the biggest reactors in the world. Um, not always the cleanest of <laughs> of reactors, but the um, the process itself is fascinating, and it's a counter current heat mass exchanger. So solid raw materials, coke, iron ore, fluxes are charged at the top of the the furnace, and then you've got a, a heated blast of air that's directed in from the bottom of the furnace. So the highest temperatures are at the bottom of the furn bottom of the furnace, uh, which and they they typically raceway adiabatic flame temperatures in the region of 2200 and then at the top of the furnace you've got temperatures that are closer to to a, to 100 and most of the energy comes from uh, this carbon based coke or injected re reductants like i've been involved with injected coal so compared to the other the other the other technologies you know the the energy balance specific energy then uh, gigajoules per ten is highest for the blast furnace. So then, looking at producing um, steel, uh, the iron containing a certain percentage, of typically about four percent carbon, goes into the basic oxygen furnace, where it's that carbon is combusted off. And there are, Overall, that route for making steel, um, most of the emissions are associated with iron making in the blast furnace. So uh, I've circled that figure there of, uh, I'm gonna try and highlight this. So yeah, I've, I've circled that figure there in the blast furnace of, of 1200 kilograms of CO2 per ton of, of hot metal out of it. Now, Japan has the lowest global energy intensity of this, this route. Um, but potentially, and this leads on to the evolution of the blast furnace, uh, a lot of this exhaust carbon in the form of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide can be recycled through the process to be you know, more completely utilized. And then as a material balance, the blast furnace, you know, you're using around 2.4 tons of raw materials to produce a ton of, of crude steel. So it requires a lot of, of materials as well compared to the electric arc furnace route, um, which, which doesn't require anywhere near the, the same quantity of raw materials. So historically, the developments that we've seen, the improvements that we've seen, um, have all been driven by scale, really. You know, blast furnaces have increased massively in, in size. And in fact, in 2016, POSCO, which is the Korean steel making manufacturer, they started metal production using a blast furnace with an internal volume of 6,000 cubic meters, capable of an annual production of 5.65 million tons it's a massive scale and you know it's it's an industry that's really improved its efficiency through um through scale really on the, the bottom left hand side there we've seen some real big improvements in the uh in the 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 use uh, efficient use of raw materials in the blast furnace you know quite significant reductions but as i mentioned earlier that is that the rate of the 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 um the reduction in uh, amount of material that is going into the blast furnace has kind of slowed down we're approaching more the, the thermodynamic uh, limits of the process and then on the right hand side we've got um, technological developments which uh, in in compa in comparison with the um, reduction in the equivalent of the coke rate, so quite significant reductions in the amount of coke that's going into the the, the process. And that's been an important development in improving the efficiency of the blast furnace. So currently, what are the the, the pressures on this route as a as a viable way of reducing CO two emissions? So 
it's it's the greenhouse gas emissions that I emphasised. You know, it produces quite high specific greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, its energy energy consumption is high. It's a carbon based a carbon based uh, chemical reaction, thermochemical reaction. Um, we're also seeing reductions in the availability of of quality iron ores and also the availability of lump ore. Uh, so we're seeing increases in the amount of iron ore fines. So that, that's an issue as, as, as well. And you know, ultimately, there's, there's only a, a limited amount of, of iron ore that can be extracted from, from the earth anyway. So that's a, that's a background into the industry and uh, into the blast furnace itself. Now I'm going to look a little bit more specifically into some of the work that I've been done. Now I've been looking at injection coals. Now I must be quite honest that the um, the push from the industry really is because inject coal injection is used to improve the efficiency of the blast furnace. Uh, so producing more um, for less materials. Um, and it's been driven predominantly by this efficiency, the requirement to, to uh, use different types of coals, uh, uh, coals that you know, are economically more attractive. So that the the picture in the center shows uh, the pipes which coming down, which are the hot blast, the, the heated air that's directed into the bottom of the furnace and it's directed in through these nozzles, which are located uh, around the, the bottom of the, the Bosch area of the, the furnace. That's called the bustle main, and that directs hot blast into the bottom of the furnace. And then you've got these braided metal flexes where coal is injected into the, the bottom of the furnace. And then on the right hand side, we've got this cross section of this lance, coal lance, directing uh, coal into the hot blast and that tends to this this tends to form a balloon like void known as the raceway and the raceway is where uh, sometimes you've got enriched oxygen which is injected into the furnace and this is where the temperature really ramps up and you get combustion taking or partial combustion takes place and you get the generation so you get heat generation you get um, the production of carbon monoxide, which is the main reducing uh, gas uh, in the process. You also get production of a certain percentage of hydrogen, depending on the type of coal that you're using as well. And the benefits of using this is it substitutes as a portion of the coke. And coke is uh, produced by heating coal uh, in an inert atmosphere and it it requires a lot of pre-processing. -process There's a lot of emissions associated with it. It's one of those things that you try to, to, to minimize, really. So coal injection improves this process efficiency, raises the heat, generates a reducing gas, and consequently, by improving the yield, it reduces CO2 emissions. But there are um, potential issues from it uh, because of particulate emissions, which then hinder the gas um, the, the the gas permeability through that burden of raw materials which I explained earlier in the counter current reactor but in terms of energy um, oh, where well, we typically the type of additions that you put the coal injection additions would be up to a, a couple of hundred kilograms per ton of hot metal so for say for an output of four million tons which would be typical um, of Port Talbot, we're talking about 600,000 tonnes of, of coal. And you substitute uh, that uh, about 0 0.85, 0 0.95 kilograms of coke. Um, so you avoid that coke production. So you reduce the emissions associated with it. And there's a significant energy saving. Um, best available uh, technique data quantifies that at 3.76 gig gigajoules per ton of injecting coal. So it reduces the en there's an energy, there's an energy saving associated with it. Now, in the UK, um, Fort Talbot uses granulated coal, but most worldwide in coal injection is pulverized coal. Now that saves energy associated with its injection as well, because it requires less energy to mill that coal 
prior to injection into the, to the furnace. Theoretical maximum is, is around 270 kilograms per tonne of, of hot metal. So there's still some room for improving that, but you require a certain, in the blast furnace, you require a certain amount of coal, coke, sorry, to allow this gas permeability, to allow the, 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 the blast furnace to, to function as a counter current reactor with solid materials descending and gaseous materials ascending. So I've been using a drop tube furnace um, and we use that to mimic this raceway region, this balloon like bubble that's formed in the bottom of the furnace when you inject um, coals. And this is this gives characteristics which are similar to that raceway region, high heating rate, low residence times, high temperatures. And then these images are looking into this furnace and just illustrating that um, partic coal particulates, when they're injected in at high temperature, behave differently. On the left hand side, you've got a more regular symmetrical propagation of uh, and, and combustion of materials. And then on the right hand side, this granulated injection, higher particle sizes, tends to be more fragmented. You see this particle fragmentation. So what I'm suggesting is that you know, when coals are injected, they um, they behave very differently. They burn out very differently, but they also produce because they don't completely burn out. Um, it's likely that these chars, these that are formed, then find their way into the blast furnace, and they have they exhibit different. Um, different effects like fragmentation, swelling and agglomeration, all things which are also um, very uh, applicable to um, other particulate iron making processes like Finex, for example, or Hisana. Um, surface, I've, we've used X-ray photo and electron spectroscopy to analyze the surface chemistry and then correlate that then with reactivity to try and improve that. And we've looked at the gasification reactivity of these partially burnt chars because um, these partially burnt chars, there'll be insufficient oxygen to combust those further in the furnace. So they have to react by uh, the, the boudoir gasification reaction then uh, to, to generate more carbon monoxide. And then this picture illustrates here the difference uh, in the char volume, this is the same massive material. This is the, the the coal, same mass of coal and char. So the the char can occupy a, a larger volume, and that has implications on the efficient utilization. So what I'm looking at more, uh, uh, what I've been looking at more recently is the use of plastics and, and potentially biomass paper. Um, in reducing the CO2 emissions. And the importance of this is that the, potentially there's, there's room to improve the, the CO2 emissions from plastics injection. So not only are you repurposing the blast furnace, not only are you utilizing material that otherwise might find its way into landfill, but you're also substituting, importantly, you're substituting mined coal. Um, and in the process, you are improving the, the, the CO2 um, savings per ton of, of hot metal, uh, for, per ton uh, of, of plastic that's injected into the, the furnace. This is not something new, although I have been looking at a combined paper plastics product called Subcoal. Um, generally, blast furnace operators are either looking at biomass or biomass derived material. Uh, or they're looking at plastics. They're not looking at combined um, synergies that may be there from utilizing that type of material. Uh, but Verst Alpine um, use plastics injection in their furnaces. It's well established in the Japanese market. Uh, Japan adopted it primarily as a means of uh, dealing with their waste plastic. And then I mentioned that my product Subcoal uh, is a 50-50 paper plastics mix from a paper is derived, is biomass derived, isn't it? Um, 
but some countries, for example, Brazil, which has a well-established sugar industry, and Scandinavia, which has a well-established forest industry, they're particularly interested in looking at the use of biomass as a means to reduce CO2 emissions from the blast furnace process. Uh, because they've got residues available potentially there. But it's getting those residues in there to realise the CO2 savings. Uh, and in particular, this um, Matheson has done some uh, research looking at the use of or substitution of charcoal into the blast furnace, where quite significant savings of CO2 per tonne of crude steel could be achieved so demonstrated some important savings there so there's options for the blast furnace process um, in japan they're also looking at reconfiguring that process so we have the conventional blast furnace represented here um, a reason that the blast furnace utilizes a lot of energy uh, is that it's a very high temperature process. So by substituting high reactivity coke, potential, there's the potential to reduce the temperature of that process, so a low temperature blast furnace. Also then by uh, either using reducing gases such as coke oven gas or uh, natural gas, a reformed natural gas, that there's more potential to, to reduce emissions. Uh, oxygen blast furnace or advanced oxygen blast furnace, top gas recycling, all ways to modify the blast furnace. And then on the right hand side, we've got um, a, a figure that illustrates the reduction in this coke rate, which is very important to, of course, there'll be, there's a, a theoretical minimum then uh, for, for that, but because of this requirement for the gas permeability but some significant changes uh, some in significant improvements in uh, the the coke rates uh, associated with the blast furnace there so this potential blast furnace in the uh, evolution could going from the conventional to the oxygen blast furnace could also drive blast furnaces to, to perhaps be smaller, produce a, a more higher calorific gas that's uh, useful, uh, more useful, uh, and that can be converted to uh, perhaps um, more useful byproducts as associated with uh, the conventional blast furnace. So with higher concentrations of CO2, they're more readily separated, stored or, or utilised. And potentially, when you think about it as well, if we're talking about hydrogen in the blast furnace, then hydrogen production by electrolysis would also generate oxygen. So it could perhaps be synergistic to this kind of ox development of a, a blast furnace to higher oxygen blast furnace. So you know, there's an quite a list of potential ways to reduce blast furnace energy and emissions and quite significant savings associated with state-of-the-art power plant, coke dry quenching instead of the, the wet quenching that continues at the moment. Um, a recent article in the Financial Times quoted ArcelorMittal, which is Europe's biggest steel maker, and they've estimated that decarbonizing its facility on the continent in line with the EU's drive to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 will cost between 15 and 40 billion. So significant sums of money are going to be required to kind of rejiggle this, this industry. So options for reduced uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, in the table, we can see the bla blast furnace with the basic oxygen furnace route for producing steel uh, between 1.6 and 2.2 tons of CO2 per ton of steel. And then top gas recycling brings that down with carbon capture, brings that down further. Then you've got direct reduced iron with the electric arc furnace, uh, which brings it starts to bring it down further and then when we start to consider hydrogen we're, we're bringing those co2 emissions or specific co2 emissions right down 
Um, so it's possible even with primary steel production to bring those emissions down. Uh, with secondary steel emissions, there's already significant opportunity to, to utilise those savings. And so it, we're talking about in the blast furnace, we're talking about these innovative process modifications, top gas, oxygen, high oxygen, etc. If we increase the secondary manufacture from scrap use, then we've got associated emissions reductions with that. Biomass, carbon capture, hydrogen instead of the carbon monoxide is a reductant, and the use of alternative technology, direct reduced iron, hot briquetted iron, or low reduced iron as well. Uh, or even electrolysis from molten uh, molten iron oxide salts. So where are we in terms of the projections? Well, steel production is expected to rise to 2.8 billion tons by 2015. So large, uh, large increases in the steel production. Also, large increases are projected for the use of recycling from scrap. The International Energy Agency said that we've got to increase that use of, of, of scrap. And the CO2 emissions are expected to reach you know, way above 3 billion tons if we don't do something about it and we don't um, uh, repurpose this, this industry. And of course, the, the, the producers of, of steel, we see India is setting, it's set to increase from its current share of about 5% to, to around 20% as well. So I mentioned hydrogen pre briefly. Of course, hydrogen uh, really does have, is a, a stellar potential to reduce CO2 emissions. And there are a couple of hydrogen projects which are um, in the in the the, uh, the pipeline at the moment in Austria and in Sweden. And there's significant potential to um, reduce the emissions of hydrogen high iron production using this hydrogen based route. A variety of different ways it can be incorporated into the blast furnace, um, but there's a limit to, to, to what you can put through the, the, the blast furnace. Uh, and then it can be incorporated at a much higher level than in a direct reduced iron to produce direct reduced iron or potentially uh, if it's used as the only gas in direct reduced iron production, uh, you know, it could be very high high uh, incorporation and in associated reduce, re, um, CO2 emissions would be much lower. So the hydrogen in the blast furnace, although it reduces pressure drop in the blast furnace, which is beneficial because it's lighter and it's a less viscous gas compared to the carbon monoxide, um, the reduction of iron by hydrogen is endothermic so it has a heat requirement so it's it, it affects the heat balance which limits the overall amount of hydrogen that you can put directly into a conventional blast furnace there's also the um the the issue about supplying of of hydrogen the current annual uk hydrogen production is around 24 million cubic meters per day um and for a for an output, if if we were producing four million tons of steel per year, that would be 6.72 million cubic meters uh, of hydrogen per day. So at 28% of the U current UK capacity. And important in this consideration is how we produce that hydrogen as well, whether or not it's produced by methane reforming from fossil fuels or whether we combine that reforming with carbon capture and storage to produce a what termed as a blue hydrogen product or whether we're generated from by electroly electrolysis. And I did some back back of the envelope calculations and green hydrogen production by electrolysis. Um, would require somewhere in the region of 14 terawatt hours per year. Uh, and the current UK solar generation is 13 terawatt hours per year. So there'd be some re significant requirement to increase the hydrogen capacity. In terms of scrap based steel making, um, it requires less energy and produces much less CO2. So it's got a lot 
going for it. We talked about the electric arc furnace, but other options that are being considered is primary energy melter by ArcelorMittal Metal is, is also being considered. And that's something that's you know readily available now. Um, particularly important, we've got we export a great deal of our scrap, uh, over 8 million tons a year. Is a, the global scrap market is set to treble. Um, we, we can see the necessity to use more scrap. So there's significant opportunities there. But in the, you know, when it comes to um, competing, the UK needs to address things like the disparity uh, in electricity price and uh, consequently the knock-on effect onto the, the final product price. And then there's issues of scrap contamination, and currently it's only used for, or tends to be used for, for, for lower quality end uh, products. And then on the right hand side, you've got the figures there, which kind of show um, our UK steel production going down and the emissions going down um, for the production, but our consumption emissions are increasing. So there's this necessity to really deal with this consumption as well. So now finally, I'm just going to go quickly over some of the um, the options that are available uh, and are being looked at in other countries. In Japan, Japan are technology leaders in iron and steel making. Uh, they've got the, uh, the Japanese pr program is called Course 50. And they're looking at, it's still a blast furnace centered um, CO2 reduction, but this is through innovations in the blast furnace, carbon capture, uh, increasing the amount of hydrogen used in the blast furnace and energy savings as, as, as well. So I know your group at Warwick uh, are looking at the Hisana process with Tata Steel. And this is a really interesting smelter reduction uh, technology. Um, some interesting interactions, gas solid, gas liquid, uh, solid liquid interactions between particulates, uh, which are very interesting from a scientifically point of view. Um, the potential to reduce CO2 emissions by you know, around 20, maybe more percent but requires this, this carbon capture to really utilize big uh, CO2 reductions. Thyssen Krupp in Germany produce, uh, uh, have quite a, a well-established and clear vision. Uh, this arrow on the timeline for 2050 illustrates um, their projected um, evolution for their steel production and from the the four blast furnace setup you're incorporating hydrogen they aim to use direct reduced iron in conjunction with hydrogen production and then more complete conversion to utilizing hydrogen uh, and then utilizing hydrogen for direct reduced iron uh, into 2050. And then concurrently, they've got this carbon utilization uh, program as well, where they, they're aiming to utilize carbon dioxide from the top gas. ArcelorMittal are really, really active in this field. And they're looking at all different aspects as well, quite diverse. That's kind of what's striking, really. You've got reduction using this plasma torch. Um, where they're using natural gas dry reforming reaction. So you've got car you've got methane reacting with carbon dioxide to produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen is reducing gases in uh, the, the a modified blast furnace with with quite significant uh, savings uh, per ton of, of crude steel there. And then they're also looking at using the top gas with the steel and all project uh, in conjunction with Lanzatec, who are using uh, the, the CO2 from the top gas uh, by a biological fermentation, gas fermentation, to conversion to bioethanol. And then we've got direct reduced iron, uh, it, which, which tends to go into the electric arc, predominantly goes into the electric arc furnace. Um, Well-established technology, um, centered around countries that have uh, a large 
uh, natural gas resource um, where they use um, uh, where they produce this sponge iron and product that tend that goes into the the electric arc furnace and up to now although these technologies have been scaled they've got they've got Midrex have got um, technologies that uh, capable of producing two and a half million tons uh, of liquid metal uh, a year. Uh, sorry, uh, tons of steel per year uh, when it's in, used in conjunction with the electric arc furnace. Um, but as we've seen from the 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 overall steel consumption production and consumption uh, worldwide, it, it's still dominated by uh, the blast furnace. And then we've got some more novel opportunities in the form of electrolysis, Boston Metal Company, Sidowin, another one supported by ArcelorMittal. And then that's, there's also an equivalent within the uh, ultra low carbon steel making program in, in Europe too. So the World, uh, World Economic Forum, International, Agents, International Energy Agency, World Steel are all driving towards uh, and, and, and projecting a vision of decarbonization, a pathway to you know, 2050. Um, it's interesting to see that they have mentioned demand management, but surely demand must be a big part of dealing with these emissions in the future. And then world, these worldwide decarbonisation programmes that I've, I've listed on the left there, the ore based higher specific intensity carbon dioxide intensity products, uh, processes, they're driving towards changes in evolution in the blast furnace, top gas recycling, oxygen blast furnace, using biomass using carbon capture, using hydrogen to drive this CO2 uh, produced per tonne of steel. So the, the, the trend is from where we are currently with the, the worldwide average to utilise more scrap-based production uh, and to move this down to, uh, to a lower specific CO2 production per tonne of hot metal. So the IEA roadmap set out that governments you know, uh, key ways that th this is likely to be achieved. You know, governments are going to have to help by providing R&D funding, creating this market for near zero emissions, adopting CO2, your mandatory CO2 emissions reduction policy, and expanding this international cooperation, developing this the, the infrastructure that's required is, is going to be a significant partnership, you know, significant partnerships, collaborations that are going to be required to deliver to deliver this. And the current market activity suggests that multiple approaches um, are going to be the order of the day, really. They're going to fit policy, circumstances, resources, inf investment, social acceptance. Um, and all the while, you know, as well as this consumption and production of uh, of steel based goods, you know, a green economy is going to be supported by uh, this this steel steel production. So finally, when you consider the breadth of activity to reduce CO2 emissions from the iron and steel making in Europe and worldwide. I think it emphasizes just how necessary networks like Sustain are to, to cover what's going on. And as a focus for activity in this sector, isn't it a really exciting time for iron and steel? Uh, and above all, I hope the industry is given a proper chance to be part of that solution, which takes account of the, the whole story that can that accounts for both our consumption and our production based emissions, not just our production. So thank you very much for your attention. And I know I've probably gone over a little bit of time, but um, I hope you found it interesting and I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Julian. Please ask question to Julian directly and you can switch on your camera when you ask a question. Any question? Hi. Okay, Ross, go ahead first. Hi, um, it's a really fascinating presentation, thank you. Um, we've been looking at some of these, or starting to look at uh, the, the 
increased use of scrap and how it could be how, how more scrap could be used in the UK. One of my um, uh, biggest questions is: Do you have an opinion on which way you think the the UK steel makers will go, particularly those with blast furnace processes, um, and in the next 10, 20 years? Because the sheer cost of reinvesting, uh, of investing in steel processing to improve its CO2 is prohibitive in the UK for, for a whole list of reasons. And I just wondered if you have an opinion on which way they'll go. Yeah, I kind of guessed that question had come up and it's a really sticky, it's a really difficult one to answer really. And I don't think, you know, I, I couldn't really do it justice to be honest, other than to say that um, it requires the government and industry coming together. It requires a vision it requires something over and above what we've seen previously that business as usual is is not an option and that if we use europe and worldwide activity as any sort of example then i think what we can see is that there's not a clear single solution it's likely to be multiple solutions i mean you know the electric arc furnace is standout performer in to in terms of you know, see, reducing our CO2 emissions. Um, but we really need to be able to continue with, continue to be able to produce quality steels, which is what, you know, the UK does produce a lot of quality steels. And so we need to continue that, surely. You know, that's going to be important that we can kind of increase the amount. Yeah, ideally, we'd like to see investment and you know, support for the industry, commitment to the industry to adopt some of the opportunities that there are in the current blast furnace configuration as well. And perhaps combining that with direct reduction or electric arc furnace. I mean, it requires, you know, it requires almost fertile soil really. And when you've got prohibitive electricity prices in the UK, um, then if you are looking for market mechanisms to drive this agenda, then I don't think that the UK is always going to be struggling to do that, you know, and the, the UK through, you know, fantastic technological developments and uh, no small part to the, the skill and knowledge of its workforce has been able to retain a presence despite these difficulties. So there's a lot of capability there. Um, I'm guessing that the future is going, you know, it's, it's going to require those. It's going to require a lot of support, collaboration, creativity. Thank you. I, I could talk to you about this for hours, literally hours. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, likewise. Yeah, so, uh, answer everyone else's questions and maybe I'll send you an email. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Carl, please go ahead. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I had two questions and Russ very kindly asked one of them. Um, so my other question is, is that you, you presented really a, a great host of potential future technologies um, for, for iron making. In terms of those, particularly thinking about sort of the, uh, the plastics uh, and such, is there anything that us people further downstream need to be starting to worry about in terms of different residuals that might be starting to make its way down the chain? Um, do we need to start preparing for that now or is it much of a muchness. Obviously, when we started using more recycling, then we started to look at more copper and zinc and things. Um, is, it, is there anything else that we need to be starting to have a think about? Well, I mean, the, the first thing that occurs to me is that, you know, if we're going to electrify our transport sector, then we're going to see a lot different types of metals coming through into our scrap sector as well. Um, so, We've already had to be de deal with you know elements such as zinc when we increased gal the use of galvanized scrap, and we I think I think this is an area that we potentially could see a lot more development in really the because it fits so neatly in with a circular economy because we need to improve our recovery of these type of residuals. Also, you've got to consider that. I think that um, the change in quality of the raw materials may find an influence uh, or have an, uh, an, an influence on um, the process and how the process adapts to deal with that. 
you know, one assumes that to produce a quality steel, the front end manufacturing will have to find ways to remove those residuals before it gets to the scrap. Um, whether or not that's the case is another matter, but you know, in in the case of plastics, obviously there's a potential for a number of materials to come through. Then that could affect things like slag volumes and co-products coming out of the primary steel making. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what, yeah. Brilliant, thank you very much for that. Uh, Jusu, please. Hi, um, Julia, thank you so much for your wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, so uh, I, my question probably is uh, sort of follow up with the um, uh, last question. So in this country, so the UK already set up the, uh, the target by 2040 or 2050 net zero. And then we know the target, we know the end, and we know the other countries are doing. And then we are steel makers or a member of the steel community. If we look at the UK's situation, say uh, we know there are some uh, the, the, the multiple options there. Which option you think is the most appropriate or, or we, uh, for the UK? Well, the electric arc furnace is an obvious option to increase the amount of scrap that we use in the UK. But if energy costs are high, then it might be difficult for us to, you know, it might be difficult for the market alone to decide to make that cho choice. Yeah, then, then how we can achieve that? Is 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 the market decided? Is it? Well, preferably, yeah, we need uh, a government and market-based kind of, um, uh, sorry, the government and the market coming together to to assist really and support the the scales of investment that are going to be required. You know, steel making is going to be required for a green economy, so we should be supporting steel making. Um, we've got to acknowledge that we consume a lot of steel, even if we ignored our production, if we said, oh, the simplest solution is for us to stop production of steel in the UK, um, we're still consuming a lot of steel and surely we should be driving that agenda. We've got the skills, we've got the capability. Um, we need that marketplace and the government needs to assist in preparing the ground really for these new technologies to be adopted. So, so, what kind of government support do you, you, you expect? Well, I'm ex I'm expecting the government to, you know, it would require your know, backing investment, facilitating the that investment. You know, not necessarily nationalisation. That's probably less politically um, appealing. But I'm presuming that you know, if you're going to require the industry to um, invest as well. You're going to require the industry, you're going to need to prepare some sort of policy certainty as well. So you've got to, with the policy, the, 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 the industry needs to see that there's a policy that is going to support a particular route. You know, it, countries like Japan have, they've initiated, you know, the, gov the government has initiated the Course 50 program and it and it and it utilizes, you know, it, it's, a, it's a massive collaboration, both private, public, academic, all of that supports that 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 vision. But then, upping it to the investment is going to be, you know, another scale. And, and I don't, you know, I guess the answer is I don't have a clear, um, a clear view, okay. so okay. Or, or clear solution for that. What I do realize is that. You know, for too long, the industry has been left perhaps to its own devices. The the market has been left to its own devices, and we have to recognise that if we're going to be serious about dealing with CO2 emissions, then surely we've got to back that up, account for our consumption as well as our production of of CO2 emissions, uh, and and back it up with some sort of vision. 
Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so another question is a, a very small question is about um, your presentations. You talk about using uh, the plastics, using uh, uh, waste uh, carbon from other industries. You can save a, a large amount of carbon dioxide emission. Yep. Uh, I actually want to can you explain how do you calculate the carbon dioxide reduction? So. Well, the carbon dioxide emissions I've taken from other people's research. Okay. So, and there's a, a wide variety of that, um, and it's based on the, and it would be very dependent on the type of biomass that you're using. And it it might not readily be a solution for, for, for all uh, blast furnace operators because you might not have that resource available. In Scandinavia, you have a strong um, forest industry um, that ha that produces residual biomass uh, yeah. in conjunction to that activity. In Brazil, you've got a strong uh, sugar cane industry that produces a lot of sugar cane biomass per gas that, that can be used. Then if you want to get it into a blast furnace, you've got to get it in in a certain form. If you produce charcoal, then potentially you can utilize the um, gases from that production and then utilize the solid through injection. Um, but I've, I've taken life cycle analysis figures from uh, multiple sources of, of research then, but I haven't calculated that myself. Ah, uh, okay. Because I saw, um, like the Japanese, uh, they ha have is, uh, established uh, plastic injection to blast mm. furnace. They talk about they can reduce the carbon dioxide emission. I, I, I'm wondering if they actually include the burning of plastic will produce carbon dioxide or not. Do you think that part is uh, counted as uh, reduction or not, because what, if I think about it, if you inject plastics, you, you you produce a more or less a similar amount of carbon dioxide. Uh, yeah, well, yes, but you are substituting that carbon dioxide, you know, that carbon dioxide, you're also producing carbon monoxide, you're also producing hydrogen because plastics have a hydrogen a uh, higher hydrogen content, so you've got um, savings that are associated with those the, the the hydrogen, and all the while that is substituting coal that you would have otherwise um, mined, transported, possibly converted to coke, uh, and the emissions associated with those various steps and stages. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'll leave time to to others to ask questions. <laughs> Thank you. Michael, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. I, I just want to follow up uh, on the discussion that you should have started because I find this interesting. Um, when you use uh, finely ground uh, coal powder or plastics or bias of a feedstock and these kind of things, um, do you think the energy requirement in order to produce that material and to grind it down to the desired powder size is actually significant and should be considered in that? Yeah, it's certainly significant and um, closer scrutiny of the life cycle analysis should show that. Um, related to, or in comparison to coal, you, know, you would have to do the same with coal as well. You know, whatever form of carbon you are putting in there, um, if you utilize plastic, you haven't got the coking process to deal with. Uh, you mm -hmm. could potentially put plastics in the, in in with the coke as well. Um, so there are potential options there, but um, that will affect coke strength. Um, so yes, it should be accounted for. Plastics should require less milling than the coal. They tend to be produced. Um, they tend to be softer. Uh, they tend to be lower temperature processes. So theoretically, it, it's what I'm saying is it's necessary to account for it. Yes, of course it is. Um, but of course, you'd have have those associated milling costs with coal as well. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. And do you expect any problems actually with the impurity levels if you use, say, um, yeah, yeah. products from the forest industry? Um, do you see this more a problem for the purification or do you see this as a problem of an increased corrosion actually during steel processing? No, it's, uh, it's a good point and it's a real potential issue is, you know, um, because biomass tends to be higher in sodium and potassium in its mm -hmm. ash and mineral composition, mm -hmm. that could potentially be problematic in the blast furnace at higher you know, higher higher levels really, and those are things that you, those are things that already have to be considered with coals actually, because depending on the mm -hmm. quality of your coal, uh, depending on the mineralogy of the ash, um, they will all affect your slag volumes, interactions, volatilization, cycling through the furnace itself. Uh, biomass tends to have lower ash contents but plastics tends to be more heterogeneous and you've got problematic elements such as chlorine in there so yes and adopting uh, a method that can take all i think uh, would require some sort of you know segregation pre-processing possibly okay thanks a lot last please last question yeah, sorry. Um, there's been a discussion going on in the background for those of you viewing the chat. Um, I, I just had a comment to make, which is when we were talking about electric arc furnaces and uh, the lower CO2 emissions. And the lower CO2 emissions are only true if you look at it as the, as the electric arc furnace on a whole. If you're not using green energy for your electricity, then actually your CO2 emissions for the supply chain is still as high. So if we don't consider that, the, the argument has to be bigger than just how you're making the steel. It has to be uh, an overall supply chain discussion at some point with regard to CO2 emissions. Otherwise, we, we're missing the big picture. It's why offshoring doesn't work, because if you offshore, then we just make the CO2 elsewhere and we still kill the planet. Anyway, sorry, that wasn't the question. The question is actually from Stuart Bradley, um, which is, um, what do you think of the future of the new coal mine in Cumbria? And um, the motivation for the question coming from do you consider it to be part of the overall steel energy mix or do you think it's something that actually it, it's it's not a good argument for a coal mine if you like um well i don't know all of the details but what the details i have seen then suggest that they're not going to they've not guaranteed that all the production will go to uk plants and a lot of it will be exported and i guess when you look at it that way it's perhaps not as appealing you know, uh, is the government prepared to um, back its other policy of reducing coal uh, as opposed to um, using using the coke that's that's produced there? You know, so it's that's you know highly politicised. I know. Um, so I, I think I th I think because of that situation where a lot of the coke is still going to be exported. You know, you're going to have to back it up. If you're going to say that uh, we don't have to transport coke to UK, power, UK blast furnaces, then we have to be honest about where, el where the other stuff is going and what the emissions are associated with that transport. Thank you. Claire, you, you have any questions? I, I, as, as with a lot of people, I'm sure that there are plenty, but I think um, I, I I need to get to my next meeting, but you know, I think there's the opportunity for me to talk to Julian another time. But I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Yeah. I thought it was a lovely overview. And as you can hear, it's given a lot of stimulus for thought. And I think that that there are sort of big picture questions of what would we like to have and compromised answers of what in the current situation we likely to have. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julian, for a really wonderful talk. And really, I think everyone enjoyed it and lots of 
questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there are a lot of unanswered questions there, and there's a, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. I think I think the uh, the market, I think that the, the the breadth of activity suggests that there's a lot of uncertainty. Which are the best routes? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, but, the, but this discussion, I think it's a help and uh, it's a brainstorming for everyone to think about it. Me too. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. And thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Julian. Thank, thank you as well. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.